Fortunately, I didn't have to work on Steelhead, and he did. And now you know what the results are. So with that, Bob, please take it away. <laughs> All right, well, what you got here is your, I don't know, you call it uh, your journeyman minor leaguer uh, all of a sudden sitting on the bench with a bunch of major league all-stars, so uh, you're going to have to bear with me on this. Um, huge thanks to the Wildlife Federation for putting this effort together today. I think that, uh, you know, my hope is at least that it, it, it may serve as a bit of a catalyst to move us in a different direction than the one that brings us into this room today. So uh, once again, thanks to the Federation. Okay, so uh, I thought I'd start off with a, you know, sort of a quotable quote, if you will, from yesteryear. This is, 50 years ago, there was a textbook put out that uh, sort of frames the, or provides a framework for today's discussion, but um, you can read it for yourselves. There's no record of a major fisheries management scheme that wasn't introduced in an atmosphere of desperation after the evidence of severe depletion had become too obvious for any explanation other than overfishing. So, uh, with that, we'll just kind of move right along here. <laughs> Hello. Like that little black one and the, big green one. the little black one and the big green one. Oh, that's the pointer. Oh, the big green one. <laughs> okay, there you go. So, whereas the focus is, is uh, is, is broader than uh, just the Fraser River today. I thought I'd, I'd open with, uh, with this particular reminder, a little bit grim, and it may not be exactly up to speed with what uh, Dr. Taylor was telling us earlier today, but in any case, this, this is uh, the list of Kosowick examined stocks within the Fraser River that fall within the endangered, threatened or endangered classification. So you've got 11 out of 13 Chinook, 10 out of 23 Sockeye, all the Coho, all the interior Fraser Steelhead, and, and uh, probably a Sturgeon soon to follow. If there was enough money and, uh, and time to throw at a whole bunch of other lesser known stocks, those lists would probably be a lot longer than they are. So the framework or, or the, the playing field, if you will, that we, uh, that we have to work within goes back to the, uh, the Canadian Constitution Act of 1982 and, and the uh, policy and, and court decisions that have flowed from that, but what we're left with is, is the, the priorities in order, conservation, food social and ceremonial fisheries, and third and last is uh, commercial and recreational. Now, the um, three, number three is, is allocation, and I'm not here to talk about allocation. I want to talk about conservation. You know, that is the focus. The, the allocation discussion, especially in the context of interior Fraser Steelhead is, uh, 10 years in the rearview mirror. Yeah, we're, we're talking situation desperate today. And I make the point right at the get-go here that uh, whereas uh, in, when the Constitution Act was established and, and one and two were defined or at least uh, listed, I think the distinction between one and two was fairly black and white. You know, I think people generally understood what conservation embodied or what it meant. And food, social, and ceremonial fisheries, well, okay, I guess we kind of know what that's about. But I would maintain that the, the distinction between them is, is very much blurred in today's world. And uh, what is a food, social, and ceremonial fishery? You know, we've got, it's nothing to do with food or ceremony anymore. It's, uh, it's all about economic opportunities and demonstration fisheries, escapement surplus to spawning requirement fisheries, you know, many of which are pursued with the most lethal fishing methods known to us in our waters, at least gill nets, you know, in the worst times and places for, for uh, co-migrating endangered stocks. So keep that in mind as we move along here. Now, the canary in the coal mine to me is, is the Thompson steelhead or the, the broader group of fish known as the interior Fraser steelhead, and that's, that's the Thompson to Chilcotin and those other ones that nobody even talks about anymore. They're basically lost and forgotten, but we're talking about Nahatlatch and Stein and Bridge and Seton. Um, they're, they're off the evolutionary map, essentially. So what we're left with is those other two. And I hate the word unique. It's, it's way overworked or overused, but in the context of Thompson River Steelhead, at least, I think it's worth mentioning that, that these are very, very special fish, were very special fish. 
And, and that comes from a, their basic genetic makeup. Uh, they were established, you know, by Dr. Henry Siuki in the 1970s to have a, a superior swimming ability. So if you put large average size, lots of those fish used to break 30 pounds. So large average size, superior swimming performance, you put them in a big high gradient clear water stream under an optimum temperature regime at the preferred time of the year, and you have a sport fishery of legendary proportions. These are internationally renowned fish. So much so that last year, for example, with the Thompson River closed to fishing entirely, there was a pilgrimage there by a bunch of the Thompson aficionados, you know, to basically hold a wake in recognition of the, of the stature of these fish. And the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is that about four months ago, all the prominent, you know, sort of wild fish advocacy groups in the, in the Lower Mainland area co-authored a letter and sent it to the, the provincial minister of transportation and blah, 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 whatever else she is, and, and said that, uh, how about if we rename the bridge, the, the uh, Trans-Canada Highway Bridge over the Thompson River, we're, we're going to call it the Steelhead Memorial Bridge. No response. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to race through this, but you know, I want to I want to give you a little bit of call it Steelhead 101, but you know, try and paint a bit of a picture of why Steelhead are at the disadvantage they are, and it it has to do with their life history, and not to dwell on details. But the bottom line is that you're talking about a, in order to grow a seaward migrating Steelhead, it takes a lot more time and space than it does for any salmon species. So, you know, it, with a, a freshwater age that might, might rise up to five and even six years old and a combination of ocean ages that uh, can be anywhere from a second year spawning return to a third, fourth, fifth, um, repeat spawners, put it all together and you've got a really confusing life history but you don't have very many fish, mostly because you can't produce very many of them in fresh water to send to the sea in the first place. A uh, little bit of d d this morning's discussion and, and uh, the information that I've been able to put together over many, many years concerning uh, the emigration pathways and uh, duration for steelhead smolts says that they don't linger in the, in the estuaries or the near shore areas. I can't point to three or four scientific publications to back that up, but there's a whole bunch of coded wire tag recovery data from yesteryear all going all the way back into the 1970s and early 80s that, that emphasizes that point. So, you know, for those that, that say that you know, I've heard the, the, the contention that uh, the seals are sitting off the mouth of the, the Fraser and they're eating all those Thompson, you know, that's their preferred target because they're such large smolts and all this kind of stuff. There's zero evidence in support of that, absolutely zero. Their ocean rearing, uh, you know, and it, it, it's fairly well established, at least it's established well enough to, uh, for us to be able to make intelligent decisions around managing these fish once they get back. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. Um, the business of the annual counterclockwise cycle out of the river of origin in an annual uh, circuit in, uh, counterclockwise into the Gulf of Alaska and the central North Pacific before they spin off at the end of one, two, three years, whatever, head home to spawn. The, their life history and its contortions and their limitations of the freshwater habitat and so on just automatically means that there's going to be a lot less of them than there is of salmon. So, you know, two orders of magnitude is, is a common difference between uh, the abundance of salmon and any particular species and, and steelhead. The, uh, the, that ocean distribution pattern again, uh, you know, this has been long established basically. There's, there's really not a whole lot more to be learned about where they go and uh, how long it takes to get them, for them to get there and that sort of thing. You'll note that there's nothing up in here in the Bering Sea. They basically don't go beyond the Aleutian chain and into the Bering Sea. They're not down here in the south because that's a, a temperature limitation. It's too warm down there. And they're as far, uh, as far away as Kamchatka, 5,000 kilometers, the furthest west of uh, any of our local origin fish. Okay, so 15 years or more ago, uh, there was some reason to sit down and do a kind of back of the envelope calculation of how many steelhead are there in the province of British Columbia. So. You've got to make a bunch of assumptions, obviously, but uh, I went through this and I, I guess, I don't know, some people must have believed it because I've seen it cited two or three times since. But, you know, it, I think it's, it, it's useful to pour a, put things into perspective. We have three, whoops, can I make that thing go back? Okay, so you've got, 
You've got three stock types, winter, coastal summer, interior summer, and I'll describe those a little more thoroughly later, but uh, three abundance classes, less than 500, 500, 1,000, greater than 1,000. If you sort of work through the table and do the math, you know, you can come up with some uh, estimates of what the total stock sizes are. So winter steel at 250,000, coastal summer is 25,000, interior summer is 90,000, so on. Grand total, 365,000. Now, winter steelhead are the animals of the coastal drainages and, and uh, the islands like Vancouver Island, Haida Gwaii, uh, short run streams of the coastal inlets. Uh, some of the, of the tributaries of the major Pacific drainages like the Fraser and the Skeen and the Nass to Kintaku, so on. Uh, if they occur in those rivers, they occur in tributaries that are less than 100 miles or 160 kilometers from the ocean. Coastal summer steelhead are not unlike that in that, although a much more restricted dis distribution in terms of south-north, again, they occur in, uh, in short-run coastal streams or a few tributaries of the major Pacific drainages in that same range, less than 100 miles or 160 kilometers from the ocean. Uh, there's obviously a lot less of them. The fish of interest in terms of, you know, those that are impacted by commercial fisheries and uh, fisheries in general, are the interior summer steelhead, and that's the, the classification that brackets those Thompson and Chilcotin fish. Um, they originate from tributaries of the major Pacific drainages more than 100 miles inland. So uh, that, that's a common feature in, in all the, the Fraser, the Skeen, the Stikine, Taku, the Nass, and so on. Gives you some perspective on what we're dealing with today, and, and in fact, some of those estimates might be on the liberal side. So if you, if you want to try and put this into perspective, any kind of a historical perspective, the best thing we can do is look to the, uh, is the commercial fishery landing records over the, the periods of time that are available. And I could spend two hours talking about all the nuances and, you know, uh, ins and outs of this sort of information, but, you know, just as a broad perspective, you take those three stanzas there, the, uh, the first 30 years of the last century, and then another later bracket, 50 to 60, and then 70 to 80, and, and you sort of compare the total abundance. You've got the, the catches that occurred in or near the Skeena River, in or near the Fraser River, and then the all BC catch, which includes things like uh, Johnson Strait, Georgia Strait, the west coast of Vancouver Island, uh, central coast, the, the whole package. But you can, you can look at the abundance there, and uh, you can see that, well, there appeared to be a lot of steelhead at one time, you know, especially relative to the uh, to the abundance estimates that we can make today. And I just, just to emphasize that point, you know, going back to those historical records, and by the way, these are DFO records. So um, the Skeena catch estimates, these are fish that went into cans or were sold as fresh, okay? The Skeena catch estimates exceeded 60,000 three times in that first 30 years. The all BC estimates exceeded 200,000 eight times and went to uh, 430,000 in 1919, more than the total. So they put more fish in cans or sold them as fresh fish in 1919 than they exist in the entire province of British Columbia today. So, you know, it's, it gives you a little bit of perspective about where we were and where we are. And I'd emphasize that those figures are, are certainly not complete in the sense that uh, there was uh, steelhead were commonly taken off the boat by the crews because they were low value commercially. They, um, they were commonly uh, sold as coho, especially the later in, in the uh, time series that you want to go. And oh, by the way, when the cannery capacity was glutted, they threw them away. And that was commonplace for, uh, especially for white Chinook salmon back in the early days. So, you know, what's responsible for, for uh, the decline in, in those stocks over time? Freshwater habitat degradation and loss, no. No case to be made for that. Fish farms didn't exist. Predators, eh, they used to shoot all those, you know, seals and sea lions, the so-called pinnipeds. Ocean survival, eh, yeah, we hadn't heard of things like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation or uh, the blob or, uh, and we hadn't started overloading the North Pacific ecosystem with cultivated pinks and chums and that sort of thing. So. Can't blame that either. It was harvest. Harvest, harvest, and only harvest that drove those stocks down to, to the baseline that we use today. Emphasize the point, you know, when I say baseline, here we go. We're talking about the late 1970s 
when we first started to, to take a serious look at how many fish were out there. And that was due to the infusion of money that came from the Salmonid Enhancement Program and the first ever comprehensive stock assessment initiatives that were under, undertaken by the province. So that became the benchmark, you know, all that stuff that happened a hundred years before, a hundred years of commercial fishing before the benchmark was established. So, you know, that's always something that's in the back of my mind. But in any case, you can see the trajectory from then till now. And uh, that's the pre-fishery abundance, the estimated pre-fishery abundance, and I, I believe this is Rob Bison's information. You know, Rob, is that, you did that? We're gonna blame you. Okay, so that's the pre-fishery abundance, and, and what that means is that if you wanna know what the, spawn, the estimate of spawner abundance is, you're gonna take that line and you're gonna shift it down somewhat, you know, depending on what you believe the harvest rates were, is it 10%, 25%, 40%, whatever, but, you know, whatever it was, that line is gonna be lower. The, uh, the unidirectional uh, exhibit there is, is real. There's no question about that. Um, those are the facts. Now, make the point that this, that trajectory is not exclusive to the interior Fraser steelhead. Here's some information that was provided by Dr. Marvin Rosnell through the Fraser River Sturgeon Conservation Society. Population estimates over a 14 year period of juveniles, 60 to 90 centimeter uh, juvenile sturgeon, you know, so the population of the future, and what that says is there's been a two thirds decline in that population over a 14 year period. So once again, you know, that's, are we gonna blame that on fish farms, or is it uh, habitat destruction, or is it uh, pinniped predation? Uh, no, no, and no, that's harvest. Pure and simple, that is harvest. This is the one I like best, so I'm gonna spend an extra couple of minutes on this. This is a, a coastal summer steelhead stock, the Coquihalla River, 100 miles east of Vancouver here. This is the time series over that same period of of reference when the, uh, the first infusions of Salmon Enhancement Program money were there for stock assessment. But this is a time series of the abundance of uh, Coquihalla River summer steelhead. Don't worry about the two colors out there on the far right. Uh, what, the only thing that counts is the height of those bars. And, and what you notice right away is that, yeah, well, there's interannual variability there, all right. But notice that there's no unidirectional trend like there is for those interior Fraser steelhead. This is just kind of random stuff, but, but notice, notice the, the abundance, 200, 300, 400, that sort of thing. What that's telling us is that the, the tiny, tiny little Coquihalla River with a fraction, a tiny fraction of the habitat in terms of quantity and quality that's available in the Thompson and the Chilcotin systems is outproducing them. How can that be? producing smolts of roughly the same age at the same time, that are emigrating at the same time, subject to all the same forces as a smolt coming out of the Thompson or the Chilcotin, at sea in this, at, this, at the same time, identical life history strategies, basically. The only difference between the Coquihalla fish and the interior Fraser stocks is that these guys really aren't exposed to any commercial exploitation or any net fisheries, period, regardless of who they're operated by. They're coming into the Fraser River on the peak of the freshet, debris-laden river, even some conservation regulations from DFO to do with Chinook salmon abundance. So there's just nowhere near the pressure on those fish that there is on the interior Fraser stocks whose run timing overlaps. They come much later and it overlaps the enhanced things like chum salmon, like the, uh, the, the late returning sockeye to the atom system, that sort of thing. So, you know, the, the only difference that you can point to between the status of these fish and the interior Fraser steelhead is net fisheries. Apparently they don't have spell check on PowerPoint, but uh, yeah. In any case, um, okay, so here's, here's another little bit of a data set for you that uh, when, when I sort of agreed that I was gonna do this today, I thought, well, gee, what am I gonna talk about, you know, and I, uh, yeah, the, the, the gill nets and all that kind of stuff. So, well, I should look at the immediately available data set that I had just sitting right in my little old home office there. I pull out a file and I got the, uh, the Skeena River test fishery results. So, 
This was a, a DFO contracted test fishery uh, operated by extremely experienced, capable, knowledgeable uh, gill netters that uh, same guys over, over multiple years, they're excellent fish handlers, they're meticulous data recorders, you know, I mean, this is the best of the best information you're gonna get. And what does it tell us? Well, there, I had 17 years of data immediately available, and this wasn't cherry picked. I didn't say, oh, I'm gonna take my, you know, the worst case scenario stuff and paint a picture here for you. This is 17 out of 17 years that I had there, a sample size of almost 9,000 fish, all right? The average mortality over all those years, in almost 9,000 fish, 48.2%, you know, dead on arrival, dead or dying on arrival, okay? A one hour set on slack tides, daylight only slack tides, by the best in the business, almost 50% of the fish are dead on arrival. That's instructive to me. The range was anywhere from 32 to almost 60%, depending on which year you wanted to pick on. 13 uh, separate reports that have been done in the, in the Skeena area. Uh, th the reason it's there and not in the Fraser, there's not enough fish in the Fraser to bother doing this kind of work. You know, You're, you would just never get reliable results basically. And also you default to places like the Skeena to sort of examine these kinds of things. And what they did was uh, through those, those various studies, they looked at every combination of nets, gill nets that you, you can imagine. So. We're talking about the net composition, whether it's a multi-strand or monofilament, whether with or without weed lines, 60 mesh, 90 mesh, tangled tooth nets, uh, half length net, full nets, short sets, the full spectrum of, uh, of experimentation that you can undertake with a gill net. And uh, the results were essentially consistent with, uh, with the results from the test fishery. That, that's the simplest, most straightforward analysis you could give it, you know, without drilling down into the details of one or more of those reports, but that's, that's the take home message. Sane fisheries were, were better. Um, it, the, the possibility exists to run a, a sane fishery such that uh, carrying attention to the non-target stocks, species, uh, you can release them safely and unharmed like the prescription says you should, but I'll come back to that a little bit more later on, the business of slowing it down. There were, uh, there's five, Excellent reports in the in the primary scientific literature, and Dr. Cook is here somewhere, and oh, she will be, no doubt be covering some of this later. But the point, my point, would be on this is, is that uh, the expectations around the success of of uh, releasing gillnet or even beach sand caught fish in in critical times and places is not what we hoped it would be, and and I think Dr. Cook will probably speak to that in greater detail later on. So expectations really not realized. Those are the citations, if anybody is interested, uh, see me later, but you know, this is the primary scientific literature. These, this isn't the comic book kind of stuff out there, you know, this is the real deal, so. All right, so the reality, you know, and, and selective gillnet to me is, that's the classic oxymoron of, of fisheries management in our part of the world. There's no such thing, really, if you wanna put a, you know, a tightly stretched, you know, 12 inch mesh out there, yeah, well, you can probably make it selective, but gillnets are not configured that way or operated that way. So let's uh, dispel that myth. And, 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 you know, it's beyond me what it takes for people to accept that. The gauntlet fishery thing, I'll show you an illustration of what I mean there, but the, the point is that all the studies that are ever done about, uh, you know, gillnet mortality rates and selectivity and all that are based on a single encounter. So you stretch a net out there and you, you send a fish towards it and it hits it and you sort of monitor what happens. You record that, you're out of there. That's not how commercial fisheries operate. They're gauntlet fisheries and I'll, again, I'll, I'll try and demonstrate that for you a little bit later. Um, the other business that uh, has been brought, brought to my attention several times actually is the business of uh, the dropout problem. And this, this it, it comes to me from a veteran uh, commercial fishery I don't know, employees, shall we say. But uh, he, he keep, again, he keeps reminding me, well, what about the dropout thing? Does anybody ever pay attention to that? And by dropout, that's just the, that's the fish that didn't come over the rollers onto a gill, the deck of a gill netter because they, were, they fell out before they got there. And, and it happens, and it's significant, but it's never really accounted for. So that's what I'm talking about when I say dropout. Um, the business of, uh, you got all these conditions of license that are specified by DFO. 
you must do this, that, and the other thing to treat these fish safely and let them go and all that kind of stuff. Well, there's, the compliance is low, the enforcement is zero. There are no consequences. So, you know, talk's cheap. It takes money to buy whiskey. The same selectivity, again, is promising. You've got to slow it down, and, and it doesn't work, you know, because if you look at the way the same fisheries operate now, it's, it's and, and you'll see this in, in the actual formal announcements on DFO websites about the opening, they, uh, they call it a, a derby fishery. Okay, well, what that means is, you, you know, when you get down to, say, a 12-hour opening or two 12-hour openings on successive days or that, you know, it, it's kind of a shotgun start. You've got the whole fleet out there and you bang, starting time, away they go. Time is money. You've got 12 hours to go out there and you try and catch every chum or pink or sockeye you possibly can get your net around. Well, you know, if the ratio is 1,000 to 1, guess how much attention that one fish is going to get? And, and when there's no, nobody out there watchdogging, and if they did, they, there's no consequences for non-compliance is what it amounts to. And I'll, you know, I'll stand up and debate that with a commercial fisherman any time. You know? That's the reality. So again, and you've you got the multiple catchers thing, the, the gill nets, or the, uh, the gauntlet fishery thing, all that sort of thing. Now, OK, here's my depiction. This is a sort of a scaled depiction of, the, of what I mean by a gauntlet fishery. And this is, this is the real life deal. This is the mouth of the Skeena River, the most uh, intensive gillnet fished area, the area that traditionally the highest catch of everything, especially steelhead. In the bad old days, the late 1980s and the early 90s, you would have 300 vessels fishing in that area on an opening. Each one of those little orange lines represents one gillnet fishing in that area. Okay, so ask yourself, what's the, what are the prospects of a fish? The migration route is there, or you come around the south side of the island and, and on through here, and the DFO test fishery would be just out of sight, just up here. So people will reel in horror and say, well, oh, there's not 300 boats there now. That's true, there isn't. Okay, so we'll take it down to you know the bare minimum fleet size that fished in there last, late last summer. 100 boats. Okay, so knock off two-thirds of those little orange lines, cut them back to half length if you like, because DFO's going to say, uh, well, you know, we only fish with half length nets now. Well, yeah, that's true for the last couple of weeks of the season, but not before when the sockeye is swimming through. So you make all those adjustments and then feature yourself being a steelhead that's got to get from there to there or there to there. How many of those orange lines do you think you're going to encounter? So this business of you know, measuring the mortality from a single encounter with a net is really pretty deceptive. And if you want to know what it looks like, well, OK, here's the Seine fleet in Alberni Inlet you know, focused on sockeye. And you know, again, it's a gauntlet fishery, right? You know, if, if you're a Chinook or a, a, a coho or a summer steelhead that's heading back to the Somas River up there, you have to negotiate those nets. Well, what are the prospects that you're going to get through there anytime those nets are deployed without seeing one, two, or three of them, even if you were released? We talk about, well, we, you know, we got selective fisheries in the Fraser now. We, we, we use beach seines. Does that look like selective fishing? You know, it's, uh, I mean, it's great in the boardrooms and, and uh, you know, on paper, I suppose, but the reality is you go out there and look, and it just ain't like that, you know? So they're, yeah, you can throw back all the non-target sp species out there, and you know, great, you know, it's selective. Is that selective? You know, that's uh, consequences of a gill net in the Fraser River there in the same area as last summer, you know? Like, how many sturgeon do you see there? Is that selective? It's not just non-target species of fish that we're talking about. They catch all kinds of things. You know, set gill nets in rivers is uh, not a happy story. I call this my biodiversity set, you know, a set net that uh, all five species of salmon plus steelhead. How selective is that? There's another one, another one of the biodiversity sets. Again, you know, it's, uh, what do you got? You know, chum, chinook, pink, steelhead, the whole nine yards. Is that selective fishing? Everything that comes over the gunwale of that boat's deader than a doornail, even though they're not supposed to be targeting anything other than sockeye. This one doesn't show up very good, but uh, you got a boat here, you got another boat way back there. In between them, you have a specifically designed and constructed gill net that matches the cross-sectional area of the river. 
It's being drifted bank to bank down the river. How selective do you suppose that is? And, and this isn't just one boat, you know, this, or one net, you know, they go in waves. There'll be two, three, four, one after the other. Okay, more selective fishing, eh? Right. I wish I could afford a boat like that to go selective fishing. Same net, selective fishing. Look how many dead fish are caught up in the web here. You know? They aren't any of them ever going to show up on paper as being uh, a non-target catch? Not going to happen. Another one of my quotable quotes, and uh, this goes back to uh, some work done, some fairly well-known scientists I would offer. Between them, I think they've probably got about 150 years of fishery science experience and almost 1,000 publications in scientific journals. What are they saying? There was a big dust-up in the Skeena country in 2006 because DFO called 11 consecutive days of gill netting. You know, it's like, wow, <laughs> how could you do that when you're trying to conserve coho and steelhead and that kind of thing? Well, the, the, the consequence of that was this big scientific review by these learned gentlemen. And what did they come up with? Well, the, in the end, the only really reliable selective fishing practices are those that avoid capture of non-target species in the first place. Bingo. Okay, solutions. Protect the habitat. It's a no-brainer. You know, it's the best investment you can ever make in fisheries management. Restore what you can, but recognize the limits. Well, I think we talked about that by a couple other learned speakers earlier today. You know, there are limitations. Move the fish farms on the land, yeah, great, okay, we can do that. Uh, don't count on any, uh, being able to measure any early results as if, you, if you do get there. Fix the ocean, not gonna happen. Call the pinnipeds, well, you know, there's a political firestorm ahead when we try to do that, and not that it doesn't have its times and places sort of thing where it would be useful. You gotta manage the harvest. There is no other way to do this. We have got to go back to the future, whether it's the traps that Brian Riddle talked about earlier or, uh, you know, the pound net talk that we're going to have to follow here. But, uh, you know, if, we, if we're going to continue to fish, you know, with, with such non-selective, non destructive practices of gillnets, we can never achieve any conservation objectives. End of story. Okay, I'm going to leave you with this and, and just a final comment in that... Um, you know, we're on this, in this country right now, we're on this headlong rush for reconciliation. And, and fish tend to be the currency of reconciliation. That is a recipe for disaster. The Kosowick list is just going to get longer and longer and longer if we keep on going down that path. Somehow we've got to put all three levels of government in the same room at the same time and come to grips with what is conservation how is it going to manifest itself? Who's going to be responsible if it doesn't? And so on. If we don't come to grips with that, this will never come again. So, thank you. <laughs> Somebody asked me what was in that. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Hi, Bob. <laughs> um, I feel obliged to respond to your Sturgeon slide. Um, just to clarify to the audience, you're just showing one part of the population. We do have concerns about Sturgeon on the Fraser, but they're not uh, limited to the fishery. There are significant habitat issues regarding Sturgeon. So um, those that were willing to write off habitat for fish and, and only look at the fishery are making a huge mistake. Uh, fisheries need it, habitat needs our help, everything. And uh, I hope that this group recognizes that it's, it isn't a simple issue of just tackling. And the fishery is not the simple issue. It's the most difficult one for sure. <laughs> but um, <coughs> habitat is something we can do something about as well. If we don't do something about it, we're not going to have the spawning areas for these fish, whether they're sturgeon or salmon or steelhead. And uh, I could show you lots more graphs about sturgeon, but I'm not going to take everybody's time up today about that. Okay, and you know, I'm obviously no sturgeon expert, but I just make the point that, you know, have you lost two thirds of the sturgeon habitat in the 14 year period of record there? That is a product of a lot of things that have gone on over the last 14 years. Um, in terms of gravel mining, uh, you may have heard of it on the Fraser, mm -hmm. pretty extensive. We've had uh, 
the, the channelization of the river, the changes in flows, the activities in the spawning areas, um, but not just uh, First Nation activities, lots of recreational activities in those spawning areas as well. So there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle and, and changes in productivity. We lost Ulican, uh, largely in the Fraser. We've had really declines in, in chum abundance. So the food for the fish aren't there. The habitat's not there. And that's all a function. Plus you're dealing with a fish that lives over 100 years. So we're just seeing that pattern over a 18 year period. And we're seeing signs just in the last few years that things may be on an uptick. So there may be cycles here too with populations like sturgeon that you just can't grasp with a simple graph. Um, and I didn't mean to make it that simple by any stretch of the imagination, but, but once again, I think the, you know, that, that sort of rate of decline over that short a period of time, you know, you gotta look to something other than the, the kind of sort of creeping features that you're talking about here. I mean, just my impression. I mean, there's other people in this room that know a lot more about that situation than I do. I'm just, you know, I'm basically the messenger is what it amounts to. Yeah, well, another thing to be clear on, we're looking at this with a lot of detail. I, I chair a surgeon society and, and we have a ton of work that's been going into this effort. And one of the key things to be aware of is that the, the fishery impacts on sturgeon were probably greater uh, before this period of time than they were during it. There's been cutbacks in the fisheries that have been really severe and any group working on the Fraser River can tell you about that in the last number of years. So that, that decline is probably more due to what happened with mortalities to large females in the early 90s and losing the brood stock and having problems with the spawning areas than the fishery. Um, so uh, these are complex ecosystems and, and you really need to dig into the data a lot more detail before you can, you know, it's, it's not a, a picture that we're, we're sweeping under the carpet. We're getting out there to do something about it right away. But a lot of the focus is on protecting these spawning areas from all fishing impacts as well as development. You need to explain that picture of the dead sturgeon in the nets. Yeah, well, they, they're dying in nets, but it, there's lots of fish that are dying in nets that are not going to explain the decline. Okay. Point taken. Just, I should have eliminated the sturgeon talk and stuck to the steelhead is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, it would probably have been better, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good, thanks very much, Bob. Yeah.